worship come just as you are before your God come willingly we choose to surrender our lives willingly our knees will bow with all our heart soul mind and strength we gladly choose you now come now is the time to worship come now is the time to give your heart come just as you are to worship come just as you are before your God come. Just so you all noted, I finished at three seconds before seven. Isn't that fun?
Oh, it was metal, maybe picking up metal on the thingamajig. Yeah, I bet that was it. Oh, huh, well. Uh, good evening. Welcome. Um, glad you're here. This is, uh, thank you to Pastor Rod for being here the last two weeks. And uh, Marty, I believe I saw. I think I saw, I think I saw Kristen. It's like uh, the Rob Rayner show in Chicago where I grew up. I spy Jane. I think I spied Jane last week. Uh, I did not spy Jay. Mar I spied Martin last week. This is Jay tonight. This is Martin tonight, aka Jay, and so on and so forth. And I, I did not spy anyone who was watching in worship because I wasn't able to see who was watching, but I could see you uh, as I kind of looked through and snuck in after the fact, after I got back in the worship service. So, um, thank you for being here to support Pastor Rod and, and hear from him, and thank you for covering for me. I had a wonderful time on vacation. I do not have pictures of that, but I do have pictures of one year ago. This is the, the last time I can look back on sabbatical because sabbatical was wrapping up about a year ago. So I do have a few pictures to share with you, but first, my cartoon for the evening. It is Calvin and Hobbes, as usual. Here he is sawing logs and the... That's a big, extra, extra big uh, log that gets sawed there. Calvin, it's time to wake up. Gets up, gets going. Kind of going through his day, getting ready, all that good stuff. Calvin, it's time to wake up. <laughs> Come on, you'll be late for school. My dreams are getting way too literal, <laughs> he says. All right, so a little fun with, with Calvin there. Um, I did that today because tomorrow is the first day of school for Fort Wayne Community Schools uh, and uh, Concordia High School, I know. I don't know about the other schools. Smith Academy is next Monday, I believe. Uh, but school starting back up. Uh, this Sunday, that's a reminder, if you'd like to pray for Smith Academy and the students and staff, they are meeting at 2 o'clock in, uh, in the school side of the building. And uh, the church will be on, the building will be unlocked over there. You can stop by. And uh, Mr. Smith, Corey Smith, would love to have folk from St. John uh, show up to support them. But also at 2 o'clock, you have to make a choice because we're having a uh, multi congregational worship and uh, multi denominational and multi ethnic worship uh, on Sunday from 2 till about 4 with. I can't pronounce the Latino congregation, but it's the Church of Restoration, I believe. Iglesia, Iglesia I was like, I, I'm not even going to bother, I'm sorry. Iglesia, but I, I can't remember the word in Spanish. But it's Pastor Narita's church, she's the pastor there. Pastor Karen's church, Destiny Life Center. And that's where it'll be located, the worship service on Warsaw. And also, uh, Come to Go Ministries on Baker Street, they'll, uh, they've invited their folk. We're inviting our folk to be there. We had a great time last year at the end of August uh, when we met together and had a wonderful meal following. So that's another option at 2 o'clock on Sunday. So that's a couple things coming up. Uh, now, uh, a couple pictures from a year ago. Just uh, over a year ago, we caught a Tin Caps game, and I... <laughs> My kids look like they're spacing out. That's the only picture I had, though. I didn't realize it was such a spacey one. So we'll move on because they'd probably be like, I can't believe you showed that. Uh, also about a year ago, uh, Parker and his girlfriend Katie were having some pancakes at our house before going off somewhere. I can't remember where. But that's actually a year ago today. And a year ago today, I was back in the office. So there, uh, Paul Tweet came in and snapped a picture. So that's all my mail right there that, that you see. So anyways, okay. Well, let's begin our worship. Uh, we'll talk more about the theme when we get to it. But let's begin our worship with our call to worship. Please stand as you're able. And you've got the bold parts. I've got the not bold parts. Summer dances in on golden beams. It is an abundance of God's love, filled with laughter and delight, God's gift of summer days. Let's respond in praise by singing our praise to God with our gathering song.
of the King. Clothed in majesty, let all the earth rejoice, all the earth rejoice. He wraps himself in light, and darkness tries to hide, and trembles at his voice and trembles at his voice. How great is our God. Sing with me, how great is our God. And all will see how great, how great is our God. And age to age he stands. And time is in his hands, beginning and the end, beginning and the end. The God had three in one, Father, Spirit, Son, the Lion and the Lamb, the Lion and the Lamb. How great is our God! Sing with me, how great is our God, and all will see how great, how great is our God. Name above all names, worthy of all praise, my heart will sing how great is our God. Name above all names, worthy of all praise. My heart will sing how great is our God. Then sings my soul my Savior God to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee. How great thou Uh, if you're here the last couple weeks, you know from Pastor Rod introducing it that we're in the midst of a, another seven-week sermon series. The first one was the John Orpert book uh, about God is closer than you think, and that was I thought that was a really a wonderful service, series, and I hope you got a, a lot out of that as, as far as realizing God's right here with us right now, and God wants to be with us every step of the way, every uh, day of our lives, every moment of our lives, and by God's Spirit, that is possible. God is indeed with us, and uh, we talked about ways to open up our eyes to see that and, 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 uh, and experience God's presence more fully in our lives. Well, this series is based on this book. Uh, did you flash the book at all, Pastor Rod, when you had it? It's Organic Disciples. It's a book by a husband and wife team, Kevin and Sherry Harney. Um, I have a personal connection with Kevin. I didn't I'd, I've never met his wife, Sherry, but before he had a wife, when he was a college student at Wheaton College in, in Wheaton, Illinois, I was a ninth grader at Wheaton Warrenville High School and involved with Youth for Christ. Now, Youth for Christ has a strong, it's called City Life in the Fort Wayne area, but it's, Youth for Christ has a real strong presence in northeast Indiana. It also did where I was in uh, the western suburbs of Chicago. And he, as a student at Wheaton College, volunteered to um, uh, serve in a discipleship capacity to, to mentor uh, young boys, young men in, in their faith, and he drew our straw, or whatever. <laughs> uh, I'll tell you, tell you more about that, I think, at a, at a point in the message as we reflect more. But So I actually know him, and he, all, he grew up and grew up. He 
went on to, to do some pretty cool things, including writing this book, Organic Disciples, uh, Seven, there it is, Seven um, Ways to Grow Spiritually and Naturally Share G to Grow Spiritually and Naturally Share Jesus. I heard Pastor Rod talk about, mention the organic, that he knows what organic means, but not sure what it means in the context of this book. It's the natural part. It's the organic, the natural way that we share Jesus, just like those grapes grow without, you know, they don't need instruction, and they have it embedded in their DNA. And the idea is that um, as we think more about the concepts in the book, that, that natural, organic way of growing as a disciple and sharing Jesus will come more naturally to us. That's the, that's the basic idea of the, of the organic aspect. Uh, and you saw the uh, kind of the, the road map here. Pastor Rod covered Bible engagement and passionate prayer. Tonight I'm going to be covering wholehearted worship, but I'm also going to back up to the beginning and cover some important things that they covered in the introduction. And then in the next four weeks, which, as you see, will go just past Labor Day. We are going to sneak one more Wednesday in uh, after Labor Day, and then we'll be done on Wednesdays until Advent. Uh, we'll cover organic outreach. So you kind of see the flow there of where we're going. Uh, with that, I'd like to share our scripture for tonight. And it's, surprise, surprise, a, a passage about worship. And this is from Psalm 100. Let's listen for the word of the Lord. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Know that the Lord is God. It is he that made us, and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him, bless his name. For the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever. And his faithfulness to all generations. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. Please pray with me. Lord God, may the words of my mouth, the meditations of our hearts, and the applications of our lives be acceptable in your sight, O God, our rock and our redeemer, in whom we place our trust. Amen. Grace, mercy, and peace be to you all, from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Is there anything I can do on the staticky part? It's just, uh, we haven't had that for a long time. Yeah. Yeah. So I'll, I'll put it, I'll hook it outside and maybe that'll help a little bit. We'll see. Okay. Well, I have every confidence you will hone in and ignore anything peripheral like. <laughs> Where, where are we looking, Pete? Who's a... Uh, you guys, too, if you're watching. Just ignore any little bit of a... Ch -ch 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 -ch. Oh! Pete played a trick on me. You guys, too, just ignore any little bit of a... Ch -ch -ch you might hear, and we'll be, we'll be, we'll be great, I'm sure. Okay. Uh, so... Before we get to the worship part... Uh, there are, well, let me, the big picture, you already saw kind of where we are, the seven, the seven markers. There are seven biblical markers whose purpose uh, for us is to help us become more like Jesus and propel us, number two, outward to the world with Jesus' love, grace, and truth. Now, in parentheses, I put what they really are. They're more commonly known as discipleship and evangelism, but those are kind of sort of big words and maybe seem intimidating. Uh, I'm to, you know, we, we're, how are you as a congregation with your discipleship and your evangelism? 
in practical terms, all discipleship is is becoming more like Jesus. You follow someone, and you get to know them so well that you start to look like them. Um, and it's easier for children to look like their parents biologically, and even children to look like their parents if they're adopted because they're raised in that home. And, you know, each of us probably, if I asked you, if it took time, you could say, well, I'm like my mom in this way, or like, I'm like my dad in this way, whether I like it or not, you know. I could do the same with, with both up a generation and down a generation. I can see my kids are like me in some ways, each one in different ways, and so on. It's becoming more like Jesus, and that comes by proximity. Uh, and also, there's a bit of it genetically, only instead of genetics, it's the spirit within us that helps us become more like Jesus. In a word, that is discipleship. And then helping others, inviting others into that journey of becoming more like Jesus is discipleship. It moves us outward. So these markers that we've been looking at, we're now already on the third one out of seven, are meant to do that. That's their purpose. Um, we've already considered Bible engagement two weeks ago and passionate prayer uh, last week. Thanks again, Pastor Rod. And then tonight we'll consider a third, wholehearted worship. But before we do that, as I mentioned, we need to consider what organic disciples authors Kevin and Sherry Harney call three epic questions. There's three epic questions that we have to know and think about before we get uh, a, continue to get more deeply into these, into these seven markers. The first one is this. How can I know I am growing? I am growing. I are growing. I am growing as a disciple. How can I know that I'm growing as a disciple? Well, let me start off by asking, how did you know you're growing as a kid? What's that? Measure. Growth chart. You had standards like you're, you know, this is the, yeah, I'm in the what percentile when you go to the doctor, they tell you. But even more commonly, you take something like about this and you take something like this, only it's called a ruler, and you take the kid and you have them go like this. I bet you switch cameras. I bet you're no longer in this one, are you? Uh huh, <laughs> okay. And you take the ruler and you go boop, right? And you go, Doot, doot, doot. And you see, Paul was once here, and now Paul, and now Paul is up here. Look at that. Physically, we can measure our growth very easily, whether it be height or weight on the scale or, I don't know, whatever else. I, I guess today it's more the weight than the height because we've all pretty much grown, unless we're measuring how we're shrinking. Anyone measuring how much, do, 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 do you do a reverse one? Is that even an option? You know, do we, we, if we stop marking in the walls, but maybe we should do that too as we wonder how much we're going to shrink in the, in the in, not you two, you guys, are, you guys aren't going to shrink for a long time, but, but I'm looking at the older ones around us here and starting to say, gee, I'm not maybe as tall as I once was. I don't know. I don't believe that. Pastor Rod says he used to be almost as tall as Marty. He's going to show. I can't wait. Bring your wedding picture next Wednesday. And I want to see that because she is a tall lady. You're very tall for a lady. Yes, and you're definitely a lot taller than that guy right there. Okay, so that's how we do it physically, right? Um, and how do we do it spiritually? Well, it's these seven markers that we're going to be going through. These are ways that we can measure how we're growing uh, in, the, in, the fi in the spiritual realm. But there's also something else that's equally important. Uh, and, and we have to talk about it because if we don't, uh, we're in a danger of slipping off a slippery slope into, into some other things. And, and what it is, is uh, where's your heart in, in all this measurement? Um, and it's your heart is more important in other words, than your habits. Um, heart over habits every time. The markers are about habits, all right? Um, habits of Bible study and reading God's word, habits of prayer, talking with God, habits of worship, and so on and so forth. Those are all important. We want to develop these habits and make them a regular rhythm of our lives if we haven't al already, and, and if we have, we want to kind of really reinforce it and see that continue to be the case. But if we don't have our heart in the right place, all could be lost. Cultivating a heart that beats after God and falls more and more in love with Jesus, our Lord, 
is what keeps us from the pitfalls. There's two, the twin pitfalls of radical legalism and paralyzing pride. Because if we say those markers, oh, I've got the, I've got the scripture down. I, I, I read through the Bible once a year, every year. I do Bible study. Um, I even teach the Bible. And I've got prayer down. I've got this down. But if, if, it's not, if it's all just done because of, I don't know, for whatever reason, fear or um, competition or something like that, and you don't have a heart that really wants to study the Bible so that you can fall more and more in love with Jesus or a God who made you, then you're in danger of that legalism or that pride. So it's heart over habits. And, and when you think about people around you, heart over habits will draw people to the same Jesus that you've been drawn to rather than giving people an easy reason to reject the claims of the Savior and to reject Christianity in general. And what do I mean by that? Well, I mean this. Do you know that for some people... We're the only Bible that they'll ever read? I know some of you have heard that before, but it's worth repeating. You're the only Bible some people will ever read. They'll never pick up a Bible on their own unless they see someone who says they live out the Bible and they're a follower of Jesus, and there's something about that life that is appealing, that is attractive to them. Brennan Manning points out the opposite of this. He says, and I think I quoted this back in the Orberg series, the greatest single cause of atheism in the world today is Christians who acknowledge Jesus with their lips, walk out the door, and deny him by their lifestyle. That is what an unbelieving world simply finds unbelievable. You're the only Bible some people will ever read, and it's your lifestyle and how you live that will draw people. In other words, are you loving people? Do you love yourself? Are you, do you love God? Are you, are you someone who reflects the, the things that we see Jesus reflecting in, in Scripture? But it's, you see how that's a hard thing? And if you're not careful and make it more about like, gotta do this, gotta do this, it can become just self-destructive even because you, you just, or other destructive. But it's about heart over habits. And that's, that's that umbrella here that I, I wanted to, to lift up to you as a good litmus test. It's kind of hard to see the umbrella, at least with my glasses off, but I can see it really well over there. Anyways, um, these seven fall underneath the umbrella, and those are the habits. But the good litmus test to see how well that heart is following Jesus is uh, Galatians chapter 5, 22 to 23, where we find the fruit of the Spirit. By contrast, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against such things. I love that little comment. You can do them all you want, and you're not going to get tossed in jail. Unless you're Martin Luther King Jr., and you're practicing civil disobedience, and out of love, you're refusing to go away from the counter, and there is a law on that. But there's not a law against loving someone. Let's put it that way, right? Okay, now I'm thinking of other exceptions, but you got the basic idea, right? There's no law against those things. You could do those nine facets of the fruit of the Spirit. Because look, it's fruit one, by the way. It's not fruits of the Spirit. It's fruit of the Spirit. There's one fruit, and there's nine facets to that. Those are all, so that means it's all part of the same fruit. And you cannot kind of pick and choose like you're picking fruit, fruits. Anyways, you get the idea. That's reflective of the heart. So that's the first question uh, is, how can I know I'm growing as a disciple? Consider that and think about your heart over your habit habits. And invite God's spirit in you to continue to, to transform you. The second question, the epic question that they have is lost to me. I don't know where it went, but we'll just tell you, I, I must not have made a slide for that one. Is discipleship bigger than my relationship with Jesus? Is discipleship bigger than my relationship with Jesus? If you think you have an answer to that, it's a, it's a yes or no. If you have a yes or no answer to that question, just put your finger on your nose. Just curious. 
is discipleship bigger than my relationship with Jesus? Yes or no? Don't shout it out. Just, I just kind of want to see. You're not sure, are you? Well, you got a bunch of, I'm not. Yes, it is. I'm going with yes, because that's kind of what I got from the book. <laughs> yes, it is bigger than my relationship with Jesus, and here's why. Um, you know the phrase, it takes a village, right? It takes a village to raise a child. It also takes a generational village to pass along the faith, to pass along the faith. Um, the 2 2 2 challenge, I'll come back to what that is in a second. But think about someone passing the baton, right? We're running, and they pass it, and then their, their race is done. But that person continues on and passes to the next person, the next person. Usually it's like four. And in fact, that's what it is for us. It's four different baton passes, passes that need to be made among four different generations. I want the scripture first. Here it is. This is first Second Timothy two twenty two 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 the two 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 challenge. Okay, and what Paul's writing here to Timothy, what you that's Timothy have heard from me that's Paul, through many witnesses. So there's others involved to the faith community. Entrust to faithful people. Timothy now is entrusting it to faithful people who will be able to teach others as well. One, two, three, four, okay? One, two, one, two, three, four. First, Paul teaches and invests in Timothy, a younger pastor. Paul did this with Timothy. Paul did this with Silas. Um, we see, I mean, Jesus did this with the 12 disciples. Uh, Timothy had another branch of that going on where people, others were investing with him. Anyone know who the others were that were investing in him? A generation above him and two generations above him? Eunice and Lois. You said Lois, you said Eunice. One was his grandmother and one was his mother. I'm not going to try to remember who was who. But one, uh, he, this faith that is in you that was also in, Paul cites Lois and Eunice as people who were investing in him and had the faith and they weren't ashamed or embarrassed to talk about their faith with him. I think it means that they were followers of Jesus, which is pretty cool, because that means an older generation, two older generations said, yeah, I embraced it within that generation of, of the, earth, the first generation of, of followers, if you will. He invests in Timothy. Timothy receives Paul's influence and grows himself, but then he doesn't stop there. He entrusts what he's learning to others who are reliable, and then those reliable people teach others, and together you've got this happening again and again and again. The author of this book was one of the first people who did that for me. Kevin was a Paul to my Timothy. Kevin, along with my brother Carl, were the two most instrumental outside of my parents who raised me in the Christian faith, took me to the waters and had me baptized as a baby. But when my faith came alive and I started to try to engage with this faith, it was my brother who initiated that I mean, it's a spirit doing all of this, but as far as human people, it's my brother who initiated it in his dorm room at Purdue, and I'm not going to tell that story again. I've told it a lot of times. I'll tell it to you if you don't remember it and you want to hear it. I'll tell you after service. And it was Kevin. When I got back home, Carl, uh, he gave me my first Bible. Again, that's a Paul thing with the Timothy. He gave me my first Christian record. <laughs> So I got Christian music, and he plugged me into Youth for Christ, even though I was only in eighth grade. And then when the fall rolled around, nine months later, I met Kevin. He got assigned to our group, and he, we had French toast and the Holy Ghost. And he would come and pick us all up at some god-awful time in the morning, like 6 a.m., 5.45, one day a week, same day, take us to the house, because they lived in the same area as the school district. They were house-sitting for the whole year somehow. How cool is that, to be a, a, a college student and to house-sit? Uh, instead of in a dorm room, you get a whole house with your other friend. His friend was Randy. They were house-sitting in this place. <laughs> Brought us there, made French toast, ate breakfast, had Bible study over breakfast. And then hightailed it to school to get us in before the bell. <laughs> Some crazy driving that was. But he was the Paul to my Timothy. He, and, and he talks in the book, um, 
By the way, at the end of the series, I'm going to give away a copy of this book. So you got to keep coming, but I'm going to give it out. This, I have an extra copy I'm going to give away. But he talked about writing, as soon as he became a Christian, right away they told him it was important to find someone to mentor in the faith. And he has a crazy story about this person that, I mean, he didn't feel qualified, but he tried and he found someone, and it's a great story. But he was, from the very beginning of his faith walk, he was imp it was impressed upon him to do that. To the 2 2 2 principle. That um, uh, in, in that case, he was there, and he, and he was doing this. Um, but he also had some people above him who were mentoring him. If you don't have that chain in place, one, you're missing out on what Timothy got. That's the main thing. And, and two, um, you're losing the bigger picture that discipleship is more than just a relationship with Jesus. It is a, it is a legacy thing. It is a how do I connect this with others and how do I connect to the tradition that's gone on before me? Make sense? Uh, they mentioned too Psalm 78. This is another example where you see this at work, this generational, multi-generational, multi-faith generational and also in general generational thing going on. Um, and it's, for he issued his laws to Jacob. He gave his instructions to Israel. He commanded our ancestors to teach them to their children so the next generation might know them, even the children not yet born. And they, in turn, will teach their own children. See that pattern of passing the baton on down. So each generation should set its hopes anew on God, not forgetting his glorious miracles and obeying his commands. All right, that's the second question. It is bigger than just one relationship with Jesus. Third question is, what is the relationship between discipleship and evangelism? Remember, we had the example before, basically loving, getting to know Jesus, falling more in love with him, and sharing him in a, in a, in a compelling way to, to those around us, discipleship and evangelism. Um, some congregations, this is more outside the Lutheran church, to be quite honest, but they'll say that like, we're a discipling congregation. You know, we know discipleship and we disciple our members. Other congregations talk about we're an evangelism congregation. And I, I mean, I, the, the one thing I could think of is my first call was at Community of Hope Lutheran Church. I got to name the congregation and I did door knocking again and again and again and again and again and again. You get the idea. 7,000 homes got doorbelled by me and not ditched uh, with others. Others helped with that, but that was more evangelism in a sense because we were out sort of inviting people to consider Jesus. But it's not either or. It's both and. That's why it's organic disciples, seven ways to grow spiritually and naturally share Jesus. Grow spiritually, discipleship, naturally share Jesus, evangelism, right? Um, it's actually more like a marriage, evangelism and discipleship. Uh, you're not, uh, you're, you're, the two become one flesh. It's, it's a oneness that they're both together in this and um, in working together, and they, they naturally complement one another, too. If you are growing as a disciple of Jesus, your heart is going to um, hurt for that which hurts the heart of God. And that there are people who don't know that God loves them, who are lost in that sense, and, 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 and need to hear that message of love uh, and grace and mercy, forgiveness, acceptance, uh, your heart, as you get more in touch with that heart of God, is going to burn with wanting to see others know that as well. And you're naturally going to want others to know that. And the more you reach out and engage with those who are outside the church, outside the faith community, and and invite them in and see this spark in their lives when they go from a place of hopelessness or despair or uh, self-loathing or church-loathing or world-loathing. I mean, we can direct hate or God-loathing and they fall in love with all of the above. Then it sparks your own faith and you grow some more as a disciple of Jesus, right? It's, it's really, it's just as easily marriage partners and two pedals on a bicycle. I love this analogy of the bicycle and the pedals. I usually use it with faith and works. 
that our faith and our works are like two pedals on a bicycle. We can't have one without the other. It's really hard. I've had to once pedal, but when I had a s problem with one leg, I had to pedal the bicycle when I can still remember it, and I was like 12 or something. It doesn't work so well. It's meant to have two good legs pushing back and forth. The two good legs here are discipleship and evangelism. Um, one and then the other in tandem in tension with each other. So that's the relationship uh, as far as that goes. All right, now I'm going to be really brief, I'll be honest, because I got about that far in my nice developed preparation, and then, I, and then it was time to come down and be with you. So <laughs> just being honest. Uh, but, th but you can all have a little sigh of relief because you're not going to get two sermons tonight. You're going to get that sermon, and then you get this tale, this, this tale uh, which is talking briefly about a wholehearted worship. Um, so what does, what does wholehearted worship look like? All right. Um, I'm going to borrow from the book. Let me, let me just ask you, which of these is worship, okay? I'm going to read, uh, you just listen carefully, I'm going to read them all, and then I want you to tell me which one of those is worship that I read. A church building filled with passionate Christians singing songs of praise. Is that worship? What about this? A teenager on the beach looking at the crashing waves blue skies and countless grains of sand and whispering, wow, God, nice job. Is that worship? Or is this a business leader seeking to prayerfully make God honoring decisions day after day in the complexity of her secular work environment? What about this? A couple walking hand in hand and taking turns lifting up prayers and thanks and praise worship? And what about this? An artist sculpting, painting, singing, dancing, or playing their instrument with absolute focus on bringing glory to God. How about this? A group of friends sitting together and watching a sunset as they discuss ways to follow Jesus in different areas of their lives and offering all they are as living sacrifices to their good creator. All right, which of those is worship? Anyone want to volunteer? Oh, you're so smart. I can't throw one over you two. All of the above. If you were thinking all of the above, ding, 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 you're right on the nose. Worship can look like a lot of different things. Those are just a handful of examples. Uh, it might be helpful to think about worship in terms of what the Greek word that gets translated as worship, I think every single time, um, no, not every single time, but 90, 90%, um, the vast majority of the time, means literally. The Greek word for worship, it literally means, I'm not proposing, I'm already married, thank you very much. <laughs> in fact, it's funny that I'm looking at three of you. <laughs> well, you're already married too, so anyways. It is to bend the knee. It literally means to bend the knee. Now, outside of a, a proposal of marriage is a very vulnerable, servant, serving sort of thing. But besides that, where do people bend the knee? In any time, what are other examples of bending the knee? Prayer, okay, yeah, prayer. Is that what, did you say prayer too? Yeah, prayer, you bend, we, we get down on our knees. I mean, we, you know, um, our songs talk about bending our knees. So that's, that's, that's getting that worship. Outside of a, a, a Christian or a, 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 a religious or, or worship focus, like in worshiping a God, worshiping God, where else do we bend the knee? Royalty, when the presence of royalty, you bend the knee. Um, and, uh, I'm thinking also like in the Middle Ages with chivalry and not, not chival chivalry, but um, knights and whatnot, right? But that's kind of royalty too. But, but like if a knight, your liege and your lord, right? You would bend the knee uh, the, when the, uh, I guess kind of royalty as well. Ooh, yeah. When they go by, everyone bends the knee. I'm reading a book called the, um, uh, it's the Wheel of Time series by Robert Jordan. And there's a lot of, you know, Knuckling the, knuckling the forehead and bending the knee when the lords and ladies go by and all that. So it means to bend the knee. We do it when we're in the presence of someone really greater than ourselves. 
whether it be greater in any type of way you might think about that. Um, and it's a humbling of oneself. So those two things right there, I think, can help us get to the heart of wholehearted worship. We're in the presence of someone who is greater than us individually, and when we gather together in worship, then all of us collectively together. Um, and it's a humbling thing for us. We are humbling ourselves in the presence of that presence, of that person, of that deity, of God. Um, how? Uh, how do we worship? Well, R.C. Sproul suggests this. The single most important thing to understand about worship is that the only worship that is acceptable to God is worship that proceeds from a heart that is trusting in God and in God alone. He uses a lot of um, single most superlatives, I guess you might say. Single most and the only worship that's acceptable. Well, I, I'm going to hedge my bets a little bit. There. I think God will still accept my worship, but he, he, I, like, I like where he aimed this arrow. All right? He's aimed the arrow at having a heart that is trusting in God and in God alone. Do we always have that heart? I know I don't. I'm being honest. But that's the, that's, that's the target. That's my goal, is to, is to have my heart trust in God and God alone and to profess that need and that gratitude that that God that I need and I trust wants to meet me and is present in this space and in lots of other spaces, as you remember from the examples. So um, that's a bit of the, of the how. And how about where? Here we're in a place right now, right, where we're worshiping God. We've already sung a uh, song of worship. We're going to sing another one and another one after that. Uh, but this is, of course, not the only place. Uh, A.W. Tozer writes this. If you cannot worship God, the Lord, in the midst of your responsibilities on Monday, it is not very likely that you were worshiping on Sunday. <laughs> Worship's a, everywhere you go, everything you're doing, you have the um, invitation into worship. And if you can't worship God in the midst of the daily responsibilities, and maybe you weren't really worshiping God on Sunday. Something to think about. Uh, the where, though, is anywhere. Um, we can worship God anywhere. And how about this, to what end? To what end do we worship? And one more quote from John uh, MacArthur. If worship does not change us, it has not been worship. Again, that's kind of an exclusive thing that you, you know, I don't want people to leave and say, you know, I haven't changed at all, so I must not have been worshiping in there tonight, or when I tried to worship God, I haven't seen a change. So it's not meant to get you down on yourself and, you know, oh, I'm so bad, I, I didn't change. But it, again, points to the target. It points to the goal here is that worship would change us. That the more we worship God, just like, um, I mean, prayer is a similar, you know, I don't, I, and I, I, I think of prayer in a similar way. The more we pray, we talk with God, the more God speaks to us, the more we hear, the more we become like the person that we're having these conversations with. Um, I I trust Abigail's not going to watch this, so I'm going to share this story, and none of you tell her to go share it, because I'm normally not supposed to share any stories unless I have permission. How's that for an intro? But, <laughs> she, yeah, it's too late. It's already recorded out. It's already out there in La La Land. Uh, but she's been dating this gentleman for over a year now, and, you know, she sure sounds a lot like him a lot of times. All his mannerisms, not all, but I hear them, and it's like, that's just like his name. I'll at least pull his, his name out of it. Uh, worship. Is, is, I mean, you know, I mean, you get an old married couple, they start to look alike or sound alike or whatever, right? I mean, same kind of thing. But worship, we become more like um, the object of our, not like the object of worship, but as we worship God more, we'll become more like God. And it'll change us for the better. Um, it'll change us. That's the, that's the point I think MacArthur's trying to make. It's meant to bring, it, bring in positive change in our lives. Um, all kinds of examples you can look at for worship in Scripture. Um, I, I, I really like David uh, dancing before the Lord in all his might. He's, he's stripped down to the, basically to his loincloth. He's, or he's got like a little flimsy little robe thing. And no one else seems to notice or care except one of his wives. And she ends up being barren for it because she criticizes him. But David doesn't care. 
and the people don't care because they're bringing the Ark of the Covenant back into, not back into, they're bringing it into Jerusalem for the first time, into the, into, in, into the, 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 the city of David, that God's where God dwells on earth, in that covenant, it's coming in, and he is, oh, he's ecstatic. He's worshiping God with everything he has. His body itself is, is just dancing before the Lord because he's so, so thrilled uh, to be in the presence of God and to see it come among his people. Um, may we have that type of spirit, that type of energy, that type of passion uh, when, when we worship. Again, where? Here, yes, but out there, anywhere, anywhere, and, and everywhere, as God's spirit within us kind of calls out deep to deep to God beyond us. Amen. This song is an, an invitation uh, in our worship to, to trade in our sorrows for the joy of the Lord, to, to take the burdens we brought here tonight and to lay them down and to enter into the joy of the Lord, which is our strength, the joy of our salvation. So let's stand together and sing, uh, Trading My Sorrows. My sorrows, I'm trading my shame. I'm laying them down for the joy of the Lord. I'm trading my sickness, I'm trading my pain, I'm laying them down for the joy of the Lord. Yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord, amen. I am pressed but not crushed, persecuted, not abandoned, struck down but not destroyed. I am blessed beyond the curse, for his promise will endure, that his joy is going to be my strength. Though the sorrow may last for the night, his joy comes in the morning. I'm trading my sorrows. I'm trading my pain. I'm laying them down for the joy of the Lord. I'm trading my sickness. I'm trading my pain. I'm laying them down for the joy of the Lord. Yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord. Amen. Christ, on the night in which he was betrayed, took a loaf of bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this often in remembrance of me. In the same manner also, after supper, Jesus took the cup. He gave thanks, and he gave it for all to drink, saying, Drink of this cup, all of you. This cup is a new covenant of my blood, shed for you and for all people. For the forgiveness of sins. Do this often in remembrance of me. For as often as we eat of this bread and drink of this cup, we proclaim our Lord's death until he comes again. Let us pray together our Lord's Prayer as it appears on the screens. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. 
and deliver us from evil. But deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Sorry about that. I was trying to pray, but also keep an eye on the screen. It messed me up. Uh, you may be seated. Uh, I think Cheryl is going to come forward, and once she and I have communed, you're all welcome to come up and commune by intinction. So take the wafer and dip it in the wine uh, or the grape juice. will be the second cup you come to as far as that goes. Again, all are welcome, of course, to receive the Lord Jesus. Cheryl, this is the body of Christ given to you. We lay our crowns at the feet of Jesus. The greatness of mercy and love at the feet of Jesus. And we cry, holy, holy, holy. And we cry, holy, holy, holy. And we cry, holy, holy, holy. Is the Lamb. Light of the world, you step down into darkness. Open my eyes, let me see beauty that made this heart adore you, hope of a life spent with you. So here I am to worship, here I am to bow down. Here I am to say that you're my God. You're altogether lovely, altogether worthy, altogether wonderful to me. And I'll never know how much it costs to see my sin upon that cross. So here I am to worship, here I am to bow down, here I am to say that you're my God, you're altogether lovely, altogether worthy. Altogether wonderful to me. Please stand as you're able. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. If you are lonely when you feel afraid, you're not the only. We are all the same in need of mercy to be forgiven and be free. It's all you've got to lean on, but thank God it's all you need. And all the people said amen. Whoa, and all the people said amen. Give thanks to the Lord, for his love never ends. And all the people said amen. If you're rich or poor, well, it don't matter. 
weak or strong, you know love is what we're after. We're all broken and we're all in this together. God knows we stumble and fall. And he so loved the world, he sent his son to save us all. And all the people said amen. Whoa, and all the people said amen. Give thanks to the Lord, for his love never ends. And all the people said amen. Blessed are the poor in spirit who are torn apart. Blessed are the persecuted and the pure in heart. Blessed are the people hungry for another start. For theirs is the kingdom, the kingdom of God. And all the people said amen. Whoa, and all the people said amen. Give thanks to the Lord, for his love never ends. And all the people said amen. And all the people said amen. And all the people said amen. Amen, amen. amen. Oh, what happened to that? I went going the wrong way? What did I do? Did I rewind all that? Well, anyways, thanks for coming. Uh, we'll, just, we'll just close this one out. Uh, I know how to do that. I've done that before. Escape, escape. <laughs> Did it on purpose that time. Thanks for coming. God bless you guys. See you next week. See you Sunday. See you around. Here, there, in the air. Have a great one. If you brought an offering, there are joy boxes in the back. Love never ends, and all the people said amen, and all the people said amen.